Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Every year we rally, we have, not every year, mostly a lot of years. I don't know, I feel like I'm in a well. You can help me out. I feel like, um, I mean, uh, every year we do a, a thing called the word. This year, the word for 2022 is run. And Pastor Joel uh, kicked this thing off this year. And it's from Hebrews, the 12th chapter, where it says, let us lay aside every weight and sin that so easily tries to trap us or try to, you know, tries to take us away from the course that God has us on. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So we've been doing that all year long. And in 2014, the word uh, that I had for myself or for the, what was for myself was the word truth. And I was very challenged that particular year uh, regarding this particular word. It came from Psalms 51 where it says, you desire truth in the inward parts. And it's in that hidden part that you make me to know wisdom. And I've just been, you know, pondering that all year long in 2014. It stood out to me because there was such a dramatic change and, and I was challenged inside of my heart that particular year. And what I found out at the end of that year, the takeaway was that I had to address some lies that had creeped in into my soul. Very strongholds that had kept me, you know, just not um, being all that God had called me to be. The one particular lie was that I wasn't enough. Anybody ever experienced that lie? Yeah. That I'm not enough. Hey, if somebody else was pastoring this church, you know, we'd be further along. We'd probably have a building. Or if someone else was, um, you know, the husband to my wife, she'd be a whole lot happier than you. Just on and on, these crazy lies. And uh, so I had to address those things. I had to walk in truth. He would tell me, it would help me overcome those lies with God's word and God's truth. Does that make sense? Man, I feel like a pro now. (laughs) Woo! Now think about it. We are the mastermind of all of our most regrettable decisions, aren't we? I'm the one that decided to go and siphon gas out of cars at my dad's employment and get caught. I'm the one that decided when we first got married to go and uh, do a rent-to-own furniture at 30-something percent interest, and by the time I finished paying our furniture, I needed new furniture. I'm the one that signed the note to go and cons- do this consolidation loan so we can pay all of our bills and use it for a vacation and only a partial of those bills. I was the mastermind. Somehow or another, I sold myself into thinking that that is a great decision. Anybody ever been there? Of course you've been there. You're the one who decided to take that extra class in college only to drop out a month later and still pay for it. Hello, you're the one who decided to flirt around with that boy, and now he's after you. You don't know how to get rid of him. You're ghosting him. You're the one who decided to dress all, what do you call that, bougie or whatever you call that, and cause, you know, attraction to yourself, and now you're trying to figure out, how do I get rid of these guys that are stalking me? We are the mastermind of all of those type of decisions. We all knew better, but we decided to ignore no better and fall in for that immediate gratification, that immediate appetite that was calling on us right then and there. Does that make sense? Our greatest challenge always lies in the mirror. We all can be deceived. We just look in the mirror. Isn't that the truth? It's called self-leadership. Self-leadership is the greatest uh, thing that we face. It's the greatest challenge that we face. Self-leadership is the critical component in a couple of different areas, in your business or your ministry, whatever it is that you're called to do, or in your parenting or in your home. Self-leadership is. Why is that? Because we, are, we said last week we're not the only people impacted by our decisions. Our decisions will also impact those that we love. As a matter of fact, those that we love and care for are going to have to live with some of the decisions that we made. Isn't that the truth? Some of us are living with the decisions that our parents made or our grandparents have made. If they would have just stopped drinking that bottle, if they would have just stayed at home and worked through their issues rather than abandoned the whole family, our life would have been a little bit different. Isn't that the truth? Our decisions have outcomes someone else you love will be forced to live with. Now consider this. Consider this real quick. Self-leadership is what determines whether or not you're going to parent 
like your mom and dad did. Why do I say that? Because self-leadership or lack of self-leadership that took place in their life affected and impacted you. It wasn't authority. They had authority over you. But self-leadership is the, one, is what, uh, is the key to influence. And if we don't have strong self-leadership, we'll weaken our influence in life. As a matter of fact, here, here's a statement. People, people rarely will, will follow uh, people that they don't respect. Isn't that the truth? People rarely listen to people they don't respect. I know students that have no respect for their parents, even though they are the authority in the home. Why? Because of self-leadership. I know employees who have no respect for employers because of how they conduct themselves and the lack of self uh, leadership on the inside. I know church members who have no respect for pastors because of the lack of self-leadership that they display from day to day. And for whatever reason, somehow we deceive ourselves into thinking that the decisions that we're making are actually great decisions, but so often we're lying to ourselves. And here's what I know about everyone in this room. Every single one of us, you can't lead yourself if you keep lying to yourself. And so we're going to have to address this issue today. It's not like a cheer me on, you know, f- awesome message, but it's going to be an awesome message. <laughs> Amen. Because this is something that we have to do. You know, in business, you fire leaders, right? You ever tried to lead a leader, a lead a liar? You can't lead them. You got to get rid of them, isn't it? <clears throat> And so, actually, that's what I'm going to be asking us to do at the very end of this message is to fire the dishonest version of your life and rehire or hire the honest version of who you are. Why? Because God desires truth in the inward parts. It's in that place that he wants us to know wisdom. So this morning, we are going to continue in a series called the right answer, and we are going to address the first question. It's the integrity question, and the integrity question goes something like this. Am I being honest with myself, really? Am I being honest with myself, really? Are you guys ready to tackle this? The whole premise of this particular series here, and Pastor Joel will be uh, coming back next week, the next couple weeks, and addressing some of those things while I go and visit. We're actually going to go to, where is it at? Kentucky? To go visit the Ark. So that's going to be kind of cool. And, but anyways, the whole premise of this series is the idea that good questions will ultimately lead to good decisions. Good questions will lead to better decisions in our lives. But the integrity question is, am I being honest with myself, really? And hopefully the bottom line of this morning's message, here's where we're going to come to a conclusion. You need to tell the truth even when it makes you feel bad about you. That's hard. Ouch. People are leaving the building now. (laughs) You never get where you need to be until you acknowledge where you actually are. And you won't acknowledge truth about, if you don't acknowledge truth about your choices, guess what? You're you're not going to be responsible for the outcomes of those choices. You'll constantly blame and be a victim of those things. So we've got to get in the habit of just telling the truth, speaking the truth, living the truth, living the truth on the inside, acknowledging some of the whispers that we hear on our shoulder that deceive ourselves and saying, you can buy that. You need that. Not only do you want that, but you need that. Does that make sense? Isn't it Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can go to the Father except through truth. Isn't that good? You know, uh, Joel turned me on to this um, author, Jordan Peterson, and I love one of his lines. He says, tell the truth, or at least don't lie. <clears throat> you got to read some of that stuff that he writes. It's fantastic. But he has a quote, and the quote goes something like this. If your life is not what it could be, try telling the truth. If you cling desperately to an ideology or wallow in nihilism, try telling the truth. If you feel weak and rejected and desperate and confused, try telling the truth. In paradise, everyone speaks the truth. That is what makes it paradise. Tell the truth, or at least don't lie. Isn't that a great, right? I love that line. I tell my grandson also, tell the truth, son. 
The lie will find you out, period. And it's beautiful if we do it ourselves. Natalie and I love to watch uh, The Voice, and we love to watch American Idol. And it always amazes me how those individuals, some of those individuals, come to the conclusion that they can actually sing. <laughs> you ever notice that? I'm like, who told you you could sing? How do you lie to yourself and say that, oh, maybe it was mom or dad's like, man, you sound awesome. You need to go audition for The Voice. It's just the craziest thing. Who does that? What kind of a person lies to themselves and actually believe it? We do. There's a, a professor by the name of Aaron Brown who calls these false narratives that we embrace, she calls it plastic truth. And I love what, there's a quote that she says, it says something like this, where's it at? What we've said so many times in our heads becomes our plastic truth. Over time, these fake parts of the story, the pieces we've, been, we've made up, actually cement into the gaps between truth. Love that quote. So in, if you have your app, we uh, began last week in Proverbs, the 27th chapter. We're going to take a look at verse 12. How many of you guys have ever been to AA or NA or CA or any of those things? Nobody's going to raise their hands, of course, right? <laughs> Well, the key to all of those recovery programs, the first number one rule is to admit, is to be brutally honest about where you're at, because that's the key to get better and get stronger in your life. And so it is in our life, period. Now, if you haven't crossed over the line of faith, if you're not a follower of Christ, that's okay, because these principles will also help you out as well. They'll help every single person in this room just being honest with where we currently are, not deceiving yourself, not buying and not selling yourself out and making decisions that will actually impact not only you, but your family, your friends, and your future. Make sense? Proverbs 27 goes something like this. The wise see danger ahead, and they do what? They avoid it. But fools are the ones that keep going, and they get into trouble. Can we say that together? We did last week. The wise see danger ahead and they avoid it, but fools keep going and get into trouble. We said last week that the wise people understand um, that life is connected. The decisions we make today will uh, impact our tomorrow. And fools, they just ignore it. They are looking at the now in the moment, the immediate gratification, the appetite that's saying, now I need it now. And they forfeit something in their future by taking heed to that thing today. There's danger ahead, he says. What's the danger? The danger is that we have an opportunity to deceive ourselves. The danger ahead is that we can believe false narratives. We can believe and embrace plastic truth in our lives. The danger ahead is that we can become a fraud. We can become a counterfeit. The danger ahead is that we begin to justify the decisions that we are listening to in our own soul. I heard this statement this week that says, justifying is another term for just a lion. <laughs> You're just a lion. Justifying is just a lion. We owe it to ourselves to be honest, right? Really. Now, is that, that's another thing. That word really, we tag it on there for a reason. Because it, it, it's important that when you ask yourself this whole week, why am I being honest with myself? Really? Really kind of just puts a stamp on it. We have a saying here at the, at the church among our staff when they come up and they say, hey, pastor, how are you doing? And the, the normal response is, oh, I'm doing good, you know, whether or not you're doing good or not. And it's just a blanket statement. But we say, hey, ask me, how are you doing? Really, when, you, when I hear the word really, it's an invitation for, the, for me to let down my guard and really just pour out all my trash on you. Be ready. <laughs> because it's important for us to be honest, right? My favorite response, if you ever hear me, I learned this a long time ago. How are you doing, Pastor? I'm doing good. Well, what about all the stuff that's going on in your life? Man, I'm doing good. Why do I say that? Because I based it on Acts 10.38, where Jesus went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. And so I just lined up my confession with what the Word of God says. And, hey, how are you doing? I said, man, I'm doing good. That's good. That is good. And so, but when he said, how are you doing, really? Then I was like, man, this sucks. 
And I would just go in and, and share. I only do that with people I can confide in, like Pastor Joel or Rick or individuals, Pastor Jeremiah. Not everyone gets to know the craziness that goes on in a pastor's head. But add the word, really. For instance, here's some, here's some great uh, questions. Why am I doing this, really? Why am I avoiding him or her, really? Why am I, am I postponing that, really? Why do I keep making excuses about this scenario, really? Why did I say yes, really? Why did I choose to wear this, really? Why did I choose to purchase or lease that? Why did I move in? Why am I moving out? Why don't I get help with this, really? And it'll really challenge you and it'll really open up your heart to what's going on inside of your own soul. A lot of times we just bypass the things that are actually happening and going on in our lives. The psychology behind this, Pastor Jerome mentioned this, I think it was him or somebody, I learned this a long time ago, but it's called confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is the tendency to give more weight to the evidence that confirms your beliefs than the evidence that challenges it. In other words, if you come to a conclusion, you come to an opinion, you will do whatever you can to uh, confirm that opinion. All the data, all the evidence that you see will line up with the thing that you are opinionated in. And the stuff that's challenging it, the stuff that goes contrary to that, you just disregard that. Confirmation bias. That's why it's very easy for us to just buy in and get self-deceived. Does the Bible say anything about this? Absolutely. Thank you for asking. <laughs> Let's talk Bible since we're in church. Is that okay? Are you kidding me? We've got five minutes left. A guy by the name of Jeremiah. Let's talk Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet. Jeremiah was an advisor. He was a coach to the kings of Judah. And as an advisor, he would try to console them in the best possible way to keep them uh, from making real poor decisions. And so there were some kings that he was overseeing and he was, um, you know, um, giving some advice to three particular kings. And these kings, they would have had a much better life. They would have lived a whole lot longer if they would have taken heed to the advice and the counsel of Jeremiah. But the advantage of being a king is you don't have to listen to anybody. And so they didn't. But at this particular time, Judah, they were, um, King Babylon was just this massive, mighty thing. And there's this guy by the name of King Jehoiakim. And King Jehoiakim, at that time, they were paying taxes. Uh, they were paying tribute every single year. And in return, they would get, you know, protection from Babylon. And after three years, King Jehoiakim decided, you know, man, I'm tired of paying taxes. Anybody tired of paying taxes? He was tired of paying taxes. And so he said, you know what? I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit paying taxes. Forget the king. Forget, you know, forget King Nebuchadnezzar. Forget Babylon. And in doing so, he was actually pleading allegiance to Egypt rather than Babylon. So Jeremiah got word on it. He goes, hey, don't do that. That's a bad decision. It's going to affect and impact the people that you love. It's going to affect anyone, everyone in here. He goes, ah, I'm tired of paying taxes. Well, sure enough, that decision caught up to him. And King Nebuchadnezzar came over and goes, hey, you stop paying taxes. And so what happens is that he arrests him. He actually puts him in chains and marches him back to where he lives because King Nebuchadnezzar collected kings. And some people collect, you know, baseball cards. Some people collect different kinds of stuff. This guy collected kings. And every now and then, just to show off how powerful he was, he would have the kings that he collected march around his courtyard. And they would uh, put their hands on the shoulders of the king that was before them, and they would just kind of march around. And the reason why they'd put their hands on them is because they couldn't see. He'd gouge their eyes out. He'd make them blind. Bad decision that Jehoiakim made. But before Jehoiakim went back to the king collector's place, uh, Nebuchadnezzar decided to um, put another king in his place, which was his son, and it's King Jehoiachin. The thing about King Jehoiachin, not only was he the son of the first guy, he was only 18 years old. Yeah, that's what I said. It's like, ah, who's going to take advice from an 18-year-old? Well, King Nebuchadnezzar kind of thought about that probably. I don't know exactly why he did this, but it only lasted three months. 
and he went back and dethroned him, and he made him a part of his collection. So before, um, he, 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 had to, he had to put another king in place, and there was nobody volunteering to become the next king. Everybody was anxious, right? And so they decided to get Uncle Zedekiah to go and take the throne of king. What's that? Theo. Theo Zedekiah. And so he was there, and he was also paying taxes. But the crazy thing happened is that he decided to do the same thing that King Jehoiakim did, which was stop paying taxes. And Jeremiah said, that is absolutely ludicrous. Don't do that. It's going to impact every single person here. It's going to impact the people that you love. That's not a good decision to make. Don't do that. And he didn't listen. So it is, uh, uh, Jeremiah said, you know what? If you don't listen to me, I'm just going to tell everybody in the streets. Hey, guys, he starts saying everything that he's not listening to him. He goes, King Nebuchadnezzar is going to be coming over here. When he comes, just open up the doors. Don't resist him because it's not going to be a good day. And so Zedekiah heard that Jeremiah was doing that, so he got upset and he wanted to shut him up, so he throws him inside of this, this well to keep, him, to keep him quiet. Well, sure enough, um, Nebuchadnezzar comes and he's going to take over the city. And when he heard about that, Zedekiah was nervous and he got upset and he got angry and he got scared. He goes, Jeremiah, come talk to your God and tell him to save us. And he said, it's not going to happen, it's too late. Your destiny is already upon you. Your fate is upon you. It's been sealed already. And so Zedekiah decides to flee. He gets scared and he flees and he leaves. And they capture him. And the very last thing that King Zedekiah sees is when they butchered, they butchered his, his family and his sons one by one. That's the last thing he got to see. And they put him in chains. They marched him out. They gouged his eyes out. And he became a part of the collection. Isn't that a great story? It's the craziest thing. Now, my question is this. I said all that to say this. Why did he do that? Why didn't Zedekiah take the sound advice that was given to him? Why did he decide to do that? Why did he repeat what he saw was clearly a poor decision? How could he be so self-deceived? Didn't he know that the decisions that he made that day would determine, you know, a crazy future for those that he loved? Didn't he know those things? Question, what would you have done? Well, if I was in charge, I'd do something different. Hmm, you think? You probably, maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't have. But that's a great question to ask. Why did Zedekiah make those kind of decisions? And the answer, Jeremiah penned it in his book. And when he evaluates, because he was the only one that was there that was able to see all that tragedy take place. And he writes about it. He writes about it in Jeremiah the 17th chapter. And Jeremiah explains why we're all prone towards self-deception. He sits there and he looks at it and he tries to give us wisdom. He's like a mentor speaking to us this morning. He goes, hey, listen, you have an opportunity to act just like Zedekiah did, just like King Jehoiakim did, just like these other guys did. What did he pin? Here's what he writes in, Je in Jeremiah 17, chapter, verse 9. He says, the heart is deceitful above all things. The heart is deceitful above all things. It's deceitful. He didn't say it was dishonest. There's a difference between people that are just being dishonest. You know people that are just dishonest. They just lie. They can't tell the truth. But deceitful is a little bit more difficult to look at and try to figure out because there's partial truth, there's partial untruth, and then there's no truth. And you got to figure that out. He says the heart is deceitful. And so here's kind of what happens. You and I, we can play this out. Let's just say we're going to Bass Pro Shop, guys. Or ladies, you're going to um, a shoe shop. And so you walk in there and you see these things that are on sale, 75% off, only today. And you walk in there and it's like, man, I want that. I want that. And so the brain is saying, he goes, you, you want that, don't you? He goes, can you start justifying? Just a lying to yourself. Start just a lying to yourself. Justify it. Make sure that you get that before you leave. 
And so you start talking to yourself. It upgrades the message to not only do you want that, but now you need that. It's like, I know I've got 20 other black shoes, but I don't have any like these shoes. You need these. I already have seven fishing poles, but I don't have one like that. You need this one. Your family's at stake. You've got to, you will catch more fish to feed your family for a longer period of time. He upgrades the message, and then next thing you know, you're buying that thing. You're drinking that. You're inviting this person, or you're leaving this person, or you're leaving her or him. We buy into them. We're self-deceived. Jeremiah goes on to say, and he adds to this, he goes, the heart is deceitful above all things, and beyond cure, who can understand it? That's why we say, he goes, I don't understand why I made that decision. I knew better. Who can understand it? Back to the integrity question. Are you and I being honest with ourselves, really? This week, I want to encourage you to have a heart-to-heart -heart with yourself, with the guy in the mirror, the gal in the mirror, and just keep asking yourself, am I being honest with myself in this area of my life, Really? Here's the question I want you to walk home with. I put it in your notes. If you're looking at the notes, it says this. Am I telling myself the truth or selling myself a regret? Great questions. Why do you continue to go out with him or her? Really? You know it's more than the six-pack that he has. Why did you file for that divorce? Really? Why are you taking that job? Why are you quitting your job? Why did you move in? Really? Really? What's the real reason you don't call those kids? What's the real reason you don't call mom or dad anymore, or your brother or your sister anymore? Why won't you tell him or her the truth about what's really going on, really? Ask yourself, am I telling myself the truth or selling myself a uh, regret? Remember, the prudent, they see danger and they do what? They avoid it. But the fools, they just keep going on and on and they get into trouble. The obstacle to our freedom that we desire could be wrapped up in how we answer this question, am I being honest with myself, really? This last week, I asked you guys to bring candy. And look what I got. On my desk, I had a whole box. Not just one, like a whole box. Somebody went and bought a whole case and left it on my desk. This is awesome. Now, they're a little bit different because they're massive Smarties. They're not little Smarties. I'm used to little Smarties, like those little Smarties. Somebody also gave me these this morning. They're little Smarties. This is what I'm used to. I know what these taste like. I can already feel it in my... I can feel it. So I was thinking about this. Like, I wonder if they taste the same. I wonder if they're going to have the same type of texture because they're too big. And so what did I do? I unwrapped it and I put them all on my table and put them in my second drawer on the right side. And that's where I keep all my candy. The kids already know, they go in there. And I put it to my mouth and I tasted it. And ah, it was just like these little ones. It felt so good. But I had this thought. It says, what if I did this to you and I unwrapped you and I put all of the contents that's inside of you and laid it out on the table. Does what's on the inside match what's on the outside? It should, because what's on the inside of this matched what's on the outside. Even though it looked a little bit different, it was bigger, but it matched, it tasted the same. And that's why I'm saying, I'm challenging myself as well. Am I being honest with myself, really, so that I can grow in a higher level of walking in truth? That's my prayer for all of us, amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for your word. We are thankful that sometimes church is just a great celebration and sometimes it's a great challenge. And so we challenge our hearts, Lord God, and by your... If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.